And again, now that I got my microphone on, good morning. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Faith's easy to talk about, ain't it? It's easy to sing that song, fear's a liar, just cast your fear in the fire. That's a, man, that's so easy to sing, but it's a little harder to live. And that first song we sung, keep the first things first, man. I tell myself that almost every day of my life. Just keep the first thing first. Boy, it's easy to tell yourself. So hard to listen to, but it's easy to tell yourself. And the truth is, and this is what we're going to talk about, because we're going to talk about some hard stuff today. But Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. And he said, with man, Great is impossibility, but with God, all things are possible. And what we have to understand is it is possible in God to throw our fear in the fire. It is possible in God to keep the first things first. And so as we talk about what we're going to talk about today, I want you to understand something. I want you just to, this is going to be the framework for the message today. God never asks you to do anything in your own strength. Never. There's not one place in all of Scripture, not one place, did God ask you to do anything in your strength. Everything he's asked us to do is within his strength and in his ability. And, 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 and so if your whole gig is, I can't, I totally agree with you. You can't. That's why he didn't ask you to do it in your strength, because you can't. And so as we go through this today, I just want you to keep this in your mind. I can't, but he can I can't, but he can. All right, bow with me as we open in a word of prayer. Father God, I want to thank you for this day. And it's a gorgeous day, God. And in my flesh, there's some days I want to throw my hands up and say, forget it. Forget it. I can't do it. I'm a lost cause. I'm sick of trying. But God, you didn't ask me to do it in my strength. You asked me to do it in yours. And God, I just ask you to keep my focus on that. And help me understand, God, that what's going on in me is not of me. That you're changing me and you're regenerating me, Lord. You're sanctifying me according to the work of the Holy Spirit and according to your will and your plan. And as I go through this, Lord, I feel like a chaotic mess. But, Lord, you're making a masterpiece. And, God, it's not of me and it's not for me to brag about. It's not for me to be boastful about. Because the work that's in us is obvious. It's of you and not of us, God. And I love that, Father God, that, that, that the world should know that you are God. You alone. I just ask you to hide me behind the cross today. Please sanctify my tongue, God. Please sanctify my mind. Not just in here, out there too, God. But I'm just asking you today to help my words be spot on with your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Last week we read the words in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 through 4. We're getting ready to read them again. But in all through Romans chapter 7, Paul is talking about the battle that goes on in every believer's life. Now I'm going to say that again. Because there's this great big controversy as to where Romans 7 is talking about before Paul got saved or after Paul got saved. Well, I'll tell you why it's for sure after he got saved. Because before he got saved, he didn't have the clash of two natures. He only owned one. You know, before he got saved, he was a fleshly being who justified everything he ever did based upon what he wanted, felt, and thought. That's the way you roll when you're living by the flesh. You do what you think, what you feel, and what you want, right? That's how we govern our life. And we justify what we do by how we think, feel, and want. Well, I, th I can't stand it when somebody says something about the Bible and they say, well, as a Baptist, I think, as a Methodist, I think, as a Democrat, I think, as a Republican, I think, who cares what you think? Right? I don't want to hurt your feelings, but it doesn't matter what you think. The Bible is about what God thinks, you know what I mean? And what God thinks is the truth, and what you think really has no bearings on it. So, as whatever you are, what you think doesn't matter. Now, that's not positive. Yeah, it is. It is positive, because you're positively going to make a mess out of your life if you do what you think and what you feel and what you want. But there is a hope in Christ when we turn to what he feels and what he thinks and what he wants, right? And, and so when Paul's going through this old nature, man, he doesn't have a struggle. But then he got saved and God, and I want you to grasp this, at regeneration, God promised that he would put his spirit in you. That's what happens when you get reborn. The Holy Spirit moves in. And this is what he promised in Ezekiel chapter 36. 
I'm going to give you a desire for my will. That's what he promised. The Holy, I'm going to put my spirit in you, and I'm going to give you a desire for my will. So now in your flesh, you got a desire for your old will. And in your spirit, you got a desire for God's will. And those two desires are polar opposites. And so you got this great turmoil going on in your life. Is anybody feeling me up in here? Do you kind of got uh, There's some saved people in the house, right? Good, because I thought I was talking to a different audience. Ever. There's the saved people up in the house. We understand it. We got this great battle going on in our life. And Paul says, I want to do good. I got this law going on in my mind. I have a desire to be godly. I want to do good. And I set out in the morning. And I, I heard a fellow say, he said, in the morning I leave my house with my sword lifted high. Going out to stand for the Lord. And I come home at night with my sword dragging behind me. Right? I got the desire to do what's good. I'm going to shine the light in the world. But I can't do it because sin keeps getting in my way. Right? Now, I'm going to ask the personal question. Keep your hands to yourself. But how many times have you ever been in situations where you feel like that no matter what you said, your actions nullified your witness? In layman's terms, it's hard to witness to somebody after you have made a butt of yourself. Right? And we do that in so many ways. It can be by throwing a fit or sharing in the gossip or telling something that was a little bit off-colored or laughing at something that shouldn't have been funny. You know what I mean? When we become selfish, when we become prideful, when we become arrogant, when we let the ugly little things stick out of us, when we become unconcerned about others' hurt feelings because we're consumed with our own feelings. Boy, it's real hard to reach somebody with the love of Jesus when you don't care about them, right? And so all of a sudden, my actions, whatever I said has been nullified by what I've done. And that's what Paul said. He said, I got the desire to do what's good and I want everybody to see the love of Jesus. But the old Paul keeps tripping me up. Woo, I can tell you, the old Derek's just like the old Paul. I keep tripping myself up. I keep getting one foot hung on the other one. And, and Paul says, but there's hope. And that's what I want you to understand. And I want you to get this. This is one of those facts that become big. In the whole book of Romans, from 1 to the end of 7, the Holy Spirit's mentioned twice. Romans 1 through 7, the Holy Spirit's mentioned two times. In chapter 8, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 19 times. All right? There's hope when we're in step with the Holy Spirit. That's what Romans chapter 8 is all about. We struggled with being in step with the flesh. That's what Romans 1 through 7 has been about. But Romans chapter 8 is talking about the new nature and being in step with the new nature. And the new nature is brought to us by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives birth to our spirit, right? So read with me in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. And it says these words. I'm going to read the first four. We read these last week. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, it is weakened by the sin nature. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of a sinful man to be a sin offering. And he condemned sin in a sinful man. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Now, this is absolutely awesome. And I just want you to get you a little bit of Romans 8, 1 before we move on. When he says, therefore, he's not talking about, in, he's not talking about a, a situation that happened after Romans chapter 7. He's talking about in spite of what's going on in Romans chapter 7. Paul says, I got this great battle going on in my flesh. That's what Romans chapter 7 is all about, right? I want to do good, but I'm struggling. I got these two laws going on in my mind. I crave God's law, but in my flesh, I still crave the law of sin. I don't know what I'm going to do. But then he says this beautiful passage of scripture. But there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me put that in layman's terms. You have, as a Christian, no sin record in heaven. You are as if you never sinned. You are justified before God. 
all my life, I just wanted to be enough to get by. Right? All my life. Like in school, if they said you got a hundred word paper to write, when I got to a hundred words, it didn't matter if it was and. I was done. Right? That was over. Because they said write a hundred words and I've officially wrote a hundred and that's what was asked and that's all I'm doing. Now, and if you had to have a C to be good enough, then a C was good enough. Right? A home run, it don't matter if it's 10 foot over the wall or it grazes the wall when it goes over. As long as it's over the wall, it's a home run, right? And I didn't care how it went over. Just as long as it went over. Right? Right? Well, here's the thing. I am saved by the blood of Jesus. Now, I want you to get this because we're going to talk about two different things today. And, and, and both of them bother a lot of people. Some people are really bothered by the, the believer having contentment with his salvation. They, they, they are really bothered by preaching that our salvation is secure. But I'm not. Because the Bible says if the Holy Spirit lives in me, it's a deposited guarantee of eternal life. And I believe God's guarantee is better than anybody's. And so God said my name was in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'm not going to lay awake anymore fearing it ain't. Because I've done that a lot. After I got saved, I kept believing. Even though I'd already accepted Jesus, I still had to be good enough. But the scripture says, if you're trying to be good enough on your own, if you're still trying to reason that you're going to go to heaven on what you've done, you don't understand grace. I'm going to say that again. If you're still trying to reason that you're going to go to heaven based on what you've done, you do not understand grace. You know why I'm going to heaven? Because he's good enough. He paid my price. He stood in my place. My debt was given to him. He took full credit for it. And his righteousness was given to me. And listen to this. And I get full credit for it. I want you to understand something. When I get to heaven, I'm going to live like I was Jesus. I am going to share in the inheritance with Christ. Now that's Bible right there. I am a co-heir with Christ. The Bible says that we're going to rule with Christ. Now, I don't even understand what that means, but I know I'm going to because God said it, right? And so when I get to heaven, I'm going to sit at the Father's table and live in the Father's house like a son. And if that doesn't give you encouragement, then I just have to quit right there because I don't know what encouragement would be. You know what I mean? Man, when I get to heaven, I'm going to sit with God as his son. He looks at me as a son. He defends me like a son. He loves me like a son. He guides me like a son. Now, I love my little girls. I love them. And every once in a while, they do something that just absolutely chaps me to no end. I mean, I tell you, but I still love them. And I'd lay down and die for either one of them right now. And I reckon I'd give everything I got for either one of them right now. And there's been times that I was so proud of them. And there's been times that I was so frustrated with them. And if you're a parent, you can feel me. But it didn't change the way I love them. I loved them just the same, even though right now the situation's a higher different than it was yesterday. And it might be a higher different tomorrow than it is today, right? But here's the thing. God has set me free and I've been given the right of a son and the Bible says nothing could snatch me out of his hand. Nothing, right? But as a Christian, and I want you to grasp this, as a Christian, the Holy Spirit isn't going to let me be content in my sin. And so when God put the Holy Spirit in me, some people say, what are you saying? What are you trying to say here? God died to set me free from sin He's not going to be content or let me be content laying in it. Right? How many people have always, always had a higher standard for your kids than other kids? Raise your hand, you dishonest parents. If you don't, I'm holding you to it. You've had a different standard for your kids than other kids. If you're a parent, you did. Right? And you even told your kids. They said, other kids are doing it. And you said, they ain't my kids. Right? You say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, but other kids don't. I don't give a rip what other kids do. You're my kid. 
But you got a different, st- they're your babies, right? Why do you want that for them? Come on, tell me, why, why do you have such a high standard for your kids? Because you love them, right? And you want for them what you believe is the best possible personality and nature they could possibly have. You want them to be loving and compassionate and respectful. You want them to be honoring and moral. Right? And God doesn't want us to welcome sin in our life. And so he's not going to do that. And so the Bible says that we've been set free and we get this freedom. Look at verse 4. I done read it. When we, we get this freedom by living according to the Spirit... And not the sinful nature. This freedom is for those who live according to the spirit and not the sinful nature. Those who are abiding in a new nature now. Now I want want you to understand this. God created everybody. Say amen. Amen. He chose everybody. Amen. And it's your job to choose him back. I want to tell you something. If a guy's got three sons... And one of them hates him. How many sons has he got? Three by blood and two by choice. And you can slice it any which way you want to. Three of them he chose. Only two of them chose him back. And you can slice it any which way you want to. It takes more than being blood kin to somebody to truly be a son. If you don't believe me, you get to the place where your kids want to hang out with you, you'll understand. You understand? When my kids were little, I made them hang out with me. <laughs> Didn't have any choice in the matter. None. Right? So it looked like we was just, you know what? We're, we're tight because I say we're tight. But when they get older, parents, when they get older, they got to choose to hang out with you. And then you'll find out where their heart is. Right? That's the truth. That's the truth. But here's the thing. Sometimes it reflects our heart. Because we may not be the perfect parent. But God is the perfect parent. And whether or not we want him or not has everything to do with it. And so those who are stepping toward the spiritual nature are choosing God back. And that's where we enter into the rest of Romans chapter 8. Follow with me, if you will, Romans 8. And we're going to read 5 through 13. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5, it says, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind on what nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit's life and peace. The sinful mind's hostile to God. It don't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body's dead because of sin, and your spirit's alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Now listen to verse 12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For you, if you live according to the sinful nature, you'll die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Now I love this because it's like heavy duty stuff, right? And it's like so hard to wrap your mind around. But I want you to grasp something here for a minute. There are two ways of living life. Just two. One is living for yourself, the flesh. And the other is living for the Spirit of God. So, you know, it's kind of like those things where sometimes in in math, you got to do things backwards, right? You remember math class when they had those written out problems? There's ten apples. And Timmy got three of them. How many apples are left? Right? So you got to look at it backwards here for a minute. Well, wait just a minute. We started out with 10 here. And Timmy got three of them. So we take these three and put them over here. There's Timmy's. Now we count this pile over here. And there's seven left. You know what I mean? So we got to go about everything. But, well, the Bible says there's only two ways of living. For God and for yourself. 
So whatever way you're living, if it's not for God, then guess who you're living for? And if you're living for yourself, it always brings death. Now I want to tell you this because this is like a newsflash to the world. There's only one way to live for God. And you can't count the ways to live for yourself. See, again, there's only one way to live for God, and all the rest of them are in the flesh category. And, and Paul says these words right here. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mindset on whatever the flesh has its mindset on. And I want you to understand something, and we're going to talk about this a little bit in a minute. That category is so big that there's no way we could write them all down. There is no way to write down all the things the flesh desires. The flesh is vile. And it starts out innocent. Like, like you got a piece of candy and I want it. That's how little kids start out. That's selfishness, right? Like you got a piece of candy. And they can give me another piece just like it. But it can never be as good as the piece you got. Because I want your piece. And the reason why I want your piece is it looks like it's giving you so much joy to have it. Right? And so I want what's giving you joy, and if I don't get it, I'll never be happy. Even if they give me another one just like it, I'll throw a fit. Isn't that the way the world is? I don't want just a house, I want your house. I don't want just a wife, I want your wife. I don't want just a job, I want your job. It's called the fear of scarcity. I'm so afraid that there's not enough in the world for us both to be happy that the only way I can be happy is to take what you have. It's the fear of scarcity. That's following the flesh. We see it show up in little big kids. I mean, we see it in the nursery. You can go in the nursery. I guarantee you the fear of scarcity is going to show up in the nursery today. One of them's going to throw a fit because the other one's got a toy. Right? And I want to tell you something. It moved from the nursery. We didn't grow out of it. We still have a fear in our flesh that there's not going to be enough for me to be happy. That's why the flesh wants to hold on to the worldly things so much. It's the fear of scarcity. I got to have all this to be happy. I got to have my pride to be happy. I got to have immorality to be happy. I have to have my image to be happy. I have to have all these things. Because if I let go of them, how will I ever be happy? That's the flesh. And here comes Jesus, and he says, I want to tell you something. If you want peace, let go of that junk and hold on to me. And you're saying, Jesus, I'll follow you, but let me bring my car. Let me bring my house. What about my wife and my girlfriend? Can I bring them too? <laughs> right? We got all these stipulations. I mean, we'll follow you, Jesus, but which way are you going? Tell me that before I start. And all of a sudden, Paul says, I want to tell you something. Listen to this. I want you to grasp this because this is going to get a little difficult as we talk about it. If you're following the flesh, you cannot please God. If you're fleshly minded, you cannot please God. And the fleshly mindset you're thinking about right now is your neighbor's. When you say that, you say, you can't follow God and be fleshly minded. And you're thinking, I told you. Unless you let that go, you don't ever be content. I've been telling you. But he's talking to you, right? He's talking to me. And that is what's so difficult is it's so easy for me to look at your sin and say, you need to let that go. But God is looking at me and saying, Derek, you need to let that go. Like I just opened up. It's so easy to talk it. Gosh, it's hard to walk it. It's so hard to say, here it is. God, take this from me. Paul says, but those who are in step with the Spirit, those who are spiritually minded, have their mind set on what God desires. Now, let me put this in perspective for you. The bunch who are walking away from God are living their life based on what they think, what they feel, and what they want. Now, I want you to hold yourself accountable for this. When you begin to reason out what you're doing by your feelings... Your thoughts and your wants, you are not in step with the Holy Spirit. When you begin to reason out what you are doing based upon what God thinks, what He feels, and what He wants, you're in step with the Holy Spirit. Right? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Is it because I want it or is it because He wants it? 
And I'm going to tell you something. It requires a lot of honesty to figure out which nature you're gratifying. Sometimes it requires deep honesty because the, a man can certainly justify his thoughts, Proverbs said, but the Lord knows the desire of the heart. He knows the truth. But we can sure make an excuse for what we're doing. I hear them. Some people say, well, God would want me to be happy, wouldn't he? Chapter and verse. Like that's not in there. I don't know if you know it or not, but that is not in there. God wants to give you his joy, not your happiness. And when you get his joy, you'll find out your happiness is junk. It's junk, right? And so whenever I begin to reason out in my life, why am I doing what I'm doing? Is it gratifying the flesh or is it pleasing the desire of God in my life? Now, here's the thing. Some people say, well, I don't know what God wants. He spent a lot of time writing it down. <laughs> uh, the revealed will of God is right here. This is what he wants for your life. And some people say, well, I don't enjoy studying the Bible. Folks, let me ask you something. If you were trapped in a hole and somebody gave you a map to the way out, would you study it? Or would you say, I don't care for reading? You know what I mean? I mean, if I'm in a hole and you know the way out, I'm going to read it. I don't like reading. But when it's the way to eternal life, I can work it in. Right? And God says, this is what I want for you. If you want to know how to get around Satan's scheme and his trap, this is it. But understand this. When you live to gratify your desire, it's always going to bring death. That's what he said. Right there, Romans 8, I just read it. Those who gratify the desires of the flesh will come to death. That's separation from God. I don't know about you, but it's so scary that there is something that lives in me that would never be happy unless it could separate me from God. It's my flesh. Paul said this, there is nothing good that lives in me that is in my sinful nature. My sinful nature is disgusting, it's vile, and it will always go the wrong way. And if you can't accept that about yourself, I pray that one day you can. Because the good news of Jesus is never really good news unless you can accept the bad news about you. That you can't do it on your own. The bad news about you is you can't do it. The good news about him is he's going to do it for you. He's going to do it in you, and he's going to do it through you. That's the good news of the gospel, is Jesus come to set me free, to get in me, to change me, to look like he looks. Right? That's the gospel news. But I can't accept the good news unless I can accept the bad news. Paul, give us the bad news. We've read it a lot. There ain't no good ones in here. If I said all the good ones stood up and you stood up, you'd be against the will of God because you ain't good. Man, ain't that hard to accept? I mean, let's be honest. Does your flesh like the fact that there ain't no good? Because all my life, I've wanted to consider myself a real good guy. Like I'm a good guy, right? I've always wanted to believe that about myself. But the Bible says in God's standard, there ain't no good in me. But when God begins to reveal the ugliness of my flesh, and that's what it is in the Bible. Remember that verse I read you last week? I challenged you. Remember that? And David said, Lord, examine my heart and know me. Oh, try me and know me and reveal in me the offensive ways. Woo! I want to tell you something. There's ways about me that offends God. And when I find out what offends God, it ought to be my passion to get rid of it. My passion. As a Christian, I got a new desire, right? And it's for his will. And so when he reveals in me the things that are offensive, it ought to become my passion to say, God, help me get rid of those things. Now, last week I was honest, and I'm going to be a little bit more honest this week. When I first began to get saved, when I, when, I, when I got saved, rather, and first began to get sanctified, let me back that up. I got saved in a moment and began sanctification, which is taken this far in my life and will take the rest of it, Right? Sanctification is one of those processes that you can't see it all at one time. Have you ever been, you know, if you, you can't see the whole sanctification process from the baptistry, right? I knew a little bit about what I had to work out, but I had no clue about how many things I had wrong when I got out of the baptistry. All I know is Jesus is fixing me, and I was happy about it, right? 
I'm saved now. Praise the Lord. And I tell you what, I had this big mess to clean up, and God started helping. And the first thing he said is, this junk right here in the middle of the floor, it's got to go. You know, Because I had some serious problems right out in the middle of the room. Some of us can relate to that. Like we had some things. Some of us have problems that you don't really need somebody to tell you because they put it in the paper. <laughs> right? It made the news. Okay. And so, so we know that, God, there's a few things I could do better on here. And so God began to work on those things. And as, like I said last week, as, as the fog began to clear on those things, other things begin to become big issues. And for me, pride and fear is some big issues. And I really didn't realize when I got saved, if you'd have told me some of the biggest issues that God was going to work out of my life was pride and fear, I'd have said, what pride and fear? I'm honest. I mean, I'm honest. I had no idea really what God was going to reveal to me years later that was deep-rooted in my life. The things that were actually, I mean, sinful habits aren't the problem. There's another problem much deeper-rooted. We're going to talk about that big in just a moment. But as God reveals to you the light, you got to walk in it if you're a Christian, right? Because he's just revealed the way. And so here's the thing. If you're, if you're making an excuse saying, well, I don't know what way to go, God. He's like, right, here's the way I want you to go, right? And so as you begin to read in here and God says, I hate lying. I hate lying. Well, what's that mean you got to do? You got to quit y'all getting this. Like, I mean, y'all are a sharp crew right here. Y'all pretty sharp, right? Because he has revealed the way. He's like, I want you to walk in the way of the truth. And that means you can't lie. Don't lie. To, and the Bible even says that. Stop lying to each other. Since you've taken off the old self with its practices and put on the new self with its practice, quit the lie. Right? And so God says, Derek, I hate lies. Don't lie. Be truthful. All right? He's revealed the ways for me to walk. And then he says, Derek, I hate hatred. Stop hating everybody that ain't like you and start loving them. Are you sure you want me to do that, God? Because that's really weird. You know, that's what I want you to do. And so he's revealed the way. Now, this is what the book of James says. And I, I, I won't, no, 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 the book of 1 John. Can we put that up on the wall, 1 John chapter 1? And this verse is 5 through 7, I think. 1 John chapter 1, 5 through 7. It says, this is the message we have heard and we declare to you, God is light and in him there ain't no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lied and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. L let me get this right down to the ground for you. When God reveals his perfect plan for our life, when we begin to walk in that plan, we have fellowship with the Father because the Holy Spirit is leading us in the path of light, right? Right? But if we remain walking in darkness after we've seen the light, the Bible says we don't have any fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We have not allowed the Holy Spirit to have his way in our life. And so the fellowship with the Son is very questionable in our life if we're not walking in the light that's been revealed. Let me explain that to you in greater detail. You can't lay in the mud anymore after you get cleaned up. You might fall in the mud. You might trip in the mud. But you can't lay down and roll in the mud anymore and feel content in it. And I've told you this before. We got some old hogs there at the house. And hogs are weird creatures. A Jew hates a hog. They are one of the nastiest creatures on the face of this earth. Some people are advertising free range hogs. You know what that means about a hog? They can eat whatever they want to. That bothers me. Because they ain't nothing a hog won't eat. They'll eat you if they have the opportunity. That's the truth about a hog. Right? They are one of nature's most disgusting creatures. They are a garbage can on hooves. They will eat anything. And get in the mud and get down, plumb down in it till you can't see nothing but their nose and their eyeballs sticking up. And just roll in it. I'm, I'm talking about they feel good about it. You know I mean, well, I, I just like going out there and watch them. Sometimes it's just amazing because you look out there and say, well, I'm missing. No, there he is. You can see his nose sticking up. Uh, wallered in it. Right? And if you was out there eating slop, like, I mean, just imagine you got your head in slop to alls out your eyes. You know what I mean? And you a hog, and all of a sudden I could just boom and make you you. If you had your head stuck in a bucket of slop right now, what would you do? If you went to lunch and they brought you out some tomatoes with that fungus growing on them, Becky's been canning tomatoes, you know what I mean? 
And if you put the tomato scraps in a bucket in the morning, they will have already sprouted some fungi. <laughs> and to me, it's like, ha! Ah, why didn't you throw that out? And she's like, the hogs want it, you know? And so you take it up there and you can't bear it. You're and man, them things, it's, I mean, this looks like me with a steak dinner. You know what I mean? And they're fighting on, you know, biting each other's ear. Get out of the way. I'm eating that. You ain't getting it. And you're sitting there going, how could it be that good? It's got mold growing on it. I mean, if somebody gave it to me and you, I'd say, you can have my part. <laughs> I mean, man, I love you. I wouldn't want to stand in your way, Right? Besides that, brush your teeth when you get done eating that because that's some sick junk, man. And the Bible says that after you have seen the light, after the Holy Spirit moves in, the Spirit is going to be disgusted by the fleshly desire. Let me explain something to you. Your old nature was that of a hog. It's disgusting. And your new nature is that of Christ-like. Spiritual nature. You used to do whatever your stomach would let you. And I want to tell you something. If you've noticed mankind, the hog might not be the most disgusting creature on the face of the earth. Humanity is so vile and so disgusting that the things that men desire and women desire will make you vomit. The things that they sell, the things that they use to get people's attention. To get people a high, mental high, is disgusting, right? And after you begin to realize that that is disgusting, the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to it, all of a sudden the things you used to like, your flesh still wants to go that way, but the Spirit in you is disgusting. Say, I ain't, go, I ain't doing that no more. I done been that extreme. Can we put the rest of Je 1 John chapter 5 up there? This is 8 on and through 10. 1 John, 1 John 1, 8 through 10. I keep telling her the wrong number. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth ain't in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now let me explain something to you. There was a doctrine preached a long time ago. It was a Wesleyan doctrine called sinless perfection. And they believed that you could acquire a state of sinlessness on this earth. And I think that that is heresy. You will never on this side of heaven be in a state where you are completely sinless. And if you do, you have lied to yourself and invented your own little halo around your head. Right? You're never going to get there on this side of heaven. However, it's just as much heresy to be welcoming a sinful state. I'm going to say that again. You're never going to be in a sinless, perfect state on this side of heaven. That's heresy. But it's, a, it's great a heresy or worse than to believe and preach that you can be content in a sinful state, right? You're never going to be content with sin if the Holy Spirit lives in you. He's going to make you miserable doing what you know you ought not do. Can a Christian say amen up in here? Because <laughs> I know I've done it. I've done it. I've harbored evil in my heart, you know, unforgiveness and anger and rage, and the Holy Spirit tried to make me miserable. Saying, this ain't what this ain't the way. This ain't the way. Woo! I want to tell you something. Galatians 5, 16, and, and I read this a few weeks ago, and we're going to close up here today because there's something that, that, that I stumbled up on this past week that I just want to show you. The, I hope this means as much to you as it has to me. Galatians chapter 5, Paul's talking about the same exact thing we've been talking about in Romans chapter 8. And so he says, I so I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Sound familiar? Same thing he said in Romans chapter 8. For the sinful nature desires what's contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what's contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Adultery and witchcraft, hatred and discord and jealousy and fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, and orgies and the like. Now I want you to look at this bunch of sins right here and I want you to realize something. He's got them broke up in four categories. Everywhere there's a semicolon, he takes a new thought to a different set of sins. So I'm going to read it a little different. He says, 
The acts of the sinful nature are these. First category of sin, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Now, I feel like really led to talk about this this morning, so if it gets awkward the next few minutes, I'm sorry, but we're, gonna get, we're riding this bus today. Sexual impurity, immorality, and debauchery are detestable to God. Right? They're detestable. Now, we're living in a world today where we need to get right down to the ground with this. Homosexuality is detestable to God. Lesbianism is detestable to God. Adultery is detestable to God. And fornication is detestable to God. Like everybody in the world saying, oh my God, I can't believe that everybody is saying and acting like it's all right to be a homosexual. That's wrong in the eyes of God. Yes, it is. And our nation has made a joke out of adultery and nobody's talking about it anymore. And folks, all of it is detestable to God. And none of it began... It, it, it all started so little. Satan starts out so little, right? He starts out right here, and he lets our mind go places it ought not go. And then our body ends up following along with it, right? And so all these things are sin. Sexual immorality is any sexual mindset or action that's impure and outside the will of God. And so all those things that I just mentioned, God calls detestable to him. He does not want that to be. And so anything we're doing... If we're in a relationship that's bringing those things, are we outside the will of God? Yes. Yes, we're outside the will of God. And there's steps and actions we need to take to get back in the will of God. And so if you're here today and those things are plaguing your life, I love you. I have walked where you're walking. I understand sexual morality had a dot of just a toe hold. It had me in a headlock. I understand where you are. Let Jesus have his way. Read the Bible for face value, face the music. The bad news is bad news. You're messed up. The good news is good news. Jesus will set you free. Amen. How many will? Impurity, sexual impurity. It's right here. Sexual impurity is in the mind. If you're thinking things you ought not think, ask God to help you. When you look at a girl, where's your eyes laying? If it's anywhere south of her face, fix that. I don't know how else to say it. Right? Fix it. You're thinking the wrong way. God has really worked on me with that. Debauchery, indulgence in alcohol and sex. Has anybody watched TV lately? Has anybody seen our culture? Our culture is defined by debauchery, the indulgence in alcohol and sex. God says that's wrong. That's not what I want. You're living for the flesh and not for the spirit. Fix that. He goes on to this, idolatry and witchcraft. We're skipping that one for a minute. We're closing on that one. And then he says, fits of rage and anger and jealousy and envy and, and not getting my way and throwing a fit about it. Right? Letting my tongue do more damage than my hands could ever repair. Right? The, James says, if you can control your tongue, you are sinless. How many of us need a little work on that? Amen? Right? We can do some work on that. Paul says, let me tell you something. When you are following your flesh, you will lash out at people in anger. You will harbor hatred in your heart. You will have selfish ambition and envy. You will have strife in your life. You will be separated because they cannot. I can't be with them because they don't think like I think. Man, that sounds like a church, don't it? Guess who he was talking to here in Galatians? He wasn't talking to a bunch of lost people who didn't know Jesus. He's talking to the church. He said, get rid of that junk. Get rid of that junk. That is not what I want. That's not what I set you free for. I didn't set you free to hate each other. I set you free to love on each other. Get rid of that junk. That's the fruit of the flesh. That's the enemy. Get rid of that junk. He says, drunkenness and orgy. You know what that is? Living life like it's a party. You know what that kind of party does? Let the flesh do whatever it wants to. I've been to them kind of parties where the flesh has its way, where we invent ways of doing wrong. You don't have to agree if you've ever been to one of them before, but I want to tell you something. They're pretty popular. You don't have to drive very far to find one. Where the humanity invents new ways of evil, right? They just keep figuring out ways to do more evil. God says, I hate that. I hate that. I hate it when you let your flesh control you. I hate it. 
Let the Spirit of God control you. But then he says, witchcraft and idolatry. Witchcraft is any power that is not godly. All right, we're going to put it all in that category. If it's a supreme power that's not God, then it's of evil. Satan is a very powerful being. He can do some really weird junk, okay? He got some serious power. I've heard people talk about being in a room with a guy who's talking about the power of Satan and he made a table levitate across the room. Could he do that? You better believe he can do it. Satan can do bigger than that. Oh, he can do some really creepy junk. Do you realize that in the plagues, the ten plagues, Satan mocked the first three or four? Huh? He can do that junk. He's weird. He is weird. The whole witch of indoor thing, that's in the Bible. Witches aren't them cute little things on Disney. They're evil. Right? They're not what you want your kid to be. It's not cute. It's satanic. God said don't attribute that to innocence because witches ain't innocent. And then he says adultery. And this right here is what I wanted to share with you. Because I want to tell you something. I, all my life, I felt like those people that bowed down to some little goofy-looking pottery was a nut. Right? I can't imagine going home and getting down on my knees and praying to a lamp. Oh, holy lamp, I'm asking you to help me. Let it rain. It's like, what in the world is the matter with you? How I mean, how far off in the head do you got to believe that this stupid little doll you got is going to do anything for you, right? That's foolish. And so I've always felt real good about adultery till I read something. Ooh, let me tell you about adultery. Uh, uh, idolatry. Idolatry is when you worship something other than God. You know what the definition of worship is? I'm glad you asked. It means to serve something with all your being and expect it to fulfill you. To worship something is simply to serve something with all of your being and expect it to fulfill you. And when you weigh it in that scale, I have worshipped a bunch of idols. And I tell you what, as I was examining myself and reading this, I was humiliated at how many ways in life I have, ex have served something with all my heart expecting it to be my fulfillment. How many people, keep your hands to yourself. Now this ain't a hand raising time right here. How many people have or are in a relationship where instead of loving somebody, they've actually worshipped that somebody? They've expected that person to be their fulfillment and they've served that person with all of their being. Yeah, you see, that can even happen inside of marriage. That you have set your spouse in the place of God. And I want to tell you something, it'll destroy marriages. It'll destroy them. Because you weren't made to worship them. You was made to be connected in love with them. But worship God and Him alone and expect Him to fulfill you. Your spouse is not to fix you or fulfill you. That's God's job. Right? What about your kids? You know, you can actually worship your kids. You can serve them with all your being and expect them to be your fulfillment. And you have set you up for failure and them up for failure. If you're worshiping your kids. You know, you, you can worship religion. God ain't even in it. It's just your religion. It's just this goofy idea that you got that's going to get you and everybody else to heaven. And it's all over our society. The Pharisees, God was religion. Jesus, he wasn't their God. He said, your father. Your father's the Satan. He said, your father's Satan. That's what he told them. You're a son of your father, Satan. <sighs> That's some pretty stout words to say to some of the most religious people on the face of the earth. Because they worshipped religion and expected it to fulfill them instead of God. Man, what about money? What about success? What about stuff? Anybody expect stuff to fill them up? Just got to get something new. Got to have something else. Got to have one more stuff and we we worship it i can never get rid of that that belonged to my grandmama what is it i don't know but it belonged to my grandmama i can never get rid of that it means everything to me garbage right because we can worship something we don't even know what it is and expect it to be our fulfillment families have died over wanting something that really nobody wanted they just didn't want anybody else to have it. They worshiped the fulfillment of getting their way. Right? 
How many people have ever thought that their way would fill them? And then when you got it, you was emptier than you ever was before. Gosh. Oh, man. So God's really working on me with two things. And I'm going to say this before the altar call, and then I'm going to let him work on you however he wants to. God has really been working on me with two things. One thing is the seat I'm sitting in. Remember when Jesus said, when you come into a banquet, sit at the lowest seat? Because the uppities that come in and sit at the higher seat, they may be asked to move to a lower seat and be humiliated, but if you sit in the lowest seat, he may ask you to move up, and you'll be honored. And God is the host of the banquet, right? And I want to tell you something. I have always been a low seat guy. Even when I was lost, I was a low seat guy because I ain't never like being in attention, right? And that's why when God called me to preach, when God called me to preach, I said, God, you got the wrong dude because that ain't my gig at all. I don't even like being in the front of the room. I, I, don't, I hate reading a paper in front of class. I'm an idiot. I'm uneducated. And if you put me up there, I'm going to look stupid. You got the wrong guy. And God said, I didn't ask you what you'd look like. I said, come on. Right? And so I'm a low seat guy, and I want, I want you to grasp what I'm about to say. I am all right in the low seat. I'm comfortable in the low seat. I don't need any credit in the low seat. My problem is when some horn tutor comes and sits in the high seat, right? Some glory seeker. And now if they're tooting their own horn telling everybody what they want to do, my problem is I want to take my seat and knock them out of their seat. Now, I want to go back and sit where I was. I just want to go over there and smack them. Get a little D-Lo Brown, you know what I mean? Know your role and shut your hole, boy, and listen to the leader of the banquet. You know what I'm talking about? That's what I want to do. And God says, I need you to stay in your seat. I am fixing you, and I am fixing him and I don't need your help to fix anybody. I need you to sit there and work on you. And here lately, that's been God's message to me. And I'm like, oh. Because God says, I want you to leave sanctification to me. I just want you to be willing to be sanctified and follow me as I lead you. That's what I want you to do. I don't need you to set them straight. I don't need you to set them straight. I need you to follow me and I will set you straight. That's what I want from you. And I got to tell you something. I'd much rather be knocking people in the head than working on me. In my flesh, right? My flesh would much rather throw rocks at somebody else as to sit there and take them. You got a flesh like that? But it's so much easier to work on other people's problems. And the second thing is this. My mouth. My mouth. And I want to tell you what I mean. Don't everybody go home and say, oh my Lord, Derek's out speaking profanities. <laughs> Derek's out telling dirty jokes. He's confessed it. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a nullifying the things that are with the things that are not. I've always been a clown my whole life. I love to laugh and go on with a bunch of old foolishness and talk about things. And sometimes I get hung up on foolishness so much I forget to talk about the things that matter. And this morning I'm sitting there reflecting and I'm like, God, you know what? This week I went on with a bunch of junk and I've missed so many opportunities to really, really hit the nail on the head. Because I was building my kingdom and not yours. And that's the gospel. See, sin isn't about some long perverted thing. Sin is about your flesh getting in the way of his kingdom. Simply that. And if you're here today and you're about to just say, golly, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. He come here every week. He keeps talking to me. People have been telling me that. Why do you preach to me every Sunday? Well, let me tell you something. I only preach to one person every Sunday, and you're looking at him. Me. I come here every Sunday to let me have it. And if it fits you, you wear it. And if you don't, you leave her hanging just where it was. But you let the Holy Spirit tell you your size. You let him tell you if it fits or not. This is what I want to leave the invitation as. Something dawned on me this morning, and I am so thankful for it. And I just wanted to grab his feet and hug him. 
I was sitting there in my chair and I had this thought and I said, God, I have always been so much better at preaching it than I have living it. And he said, I can tell you why. And I never heard his voice audibly. I heard it in my spirit as plain as anything in the world. You've always sought me preaching it. And folks, that's the truth if I ever told it. And I ain't here to toot my horn, but I know how big of a failure I was and how dumb I was and how insufficient I was. And I have never preached a message, never, that I didn't try my best to pray it up. And I've said this many a time. You give me an hour to preach a message, I can spend 30 minutes of it praying and be perfect and content. I've always been prayed up. I've always asked God, God, give me the words, give me the heart, give me the mindset because I can't do it. And he said, you know you couldn't preach it on your own. Why did you think you could live it on your own? Why did you do that? Why did you think you was going to go out there and, and just make a masterpiece out of it without me? You can't live it without me. Why don't you pray up every morning that you use your tongue for my glory? Why don't you pray up every morning that you'd keep that temper you got under control and that you'd fix what's in your yard? Why don't you get up every morning asking me to give you a means to glorify me with your flesh instead of glorifying yourself? Why don't you seek me in your life like you seek me preaching? And I was humiliated, but I was so comforted because I realized something. I don't got to fix me. I just got to let him. I'm like, God, I'm, I don't know why I couldn't get that. Like, how dumb can I be? I've been telling you for 21 years what I couldn't figure out myself. And all of a sudden, even though I know I got so far to go, I was so happy because God said, it's my job. Let me do it. Let me fix you. Just seek me. Knowing you can't. I want to tell you something. If you're here this morning, you got one of them green-eyed monsters in your closet. You've been trying real hard to put him down. You can't do it. You ain't got to. Because El Shaddai can. Won't you come as we sang our invitation? And won't you bring your junk? And I said this to God this morning. I said, Lord, I feel like my life is a big bucket full of pieces. And I don't know how to put them together. And I want to tell you something. I don't have to. Bring your bucket to Jesus and let him put it together. And if you're lost this morning, your only hope is Jesus. Won't you come and be saved? And if you're saved, your only hope is Jesus. Won't you come and read and just repent and cry out to him as we sang our invitation hymn? Won't you come? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that 